All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first episode of Yacht Talk Hacking the Boards. I'm Yako. And I'm Ben. And we're going to start with what we call a review of systems, which is just a quick overview of what we'll cover in the episode. So this episode is part one of our three-part series on angina and acute coronary syndrome. This episode will focus on the presentation, pathophys, diagnosis, and treatment of stable and unstable angina. The later episodes will cover acute myocardial infarction and post-MI complications. To kick off our discussion, let's jump into a board-style case. Ben, take it away. Great. So we're going to start with a 75-year-old male with a 200-pack year history and hyperlipidemia who comes into clinic with six months of chest pressure and dyspnea when walking upstairs or hiking. His vitals and exam are normal. What does this sound like to you, Yaakov? So Ben, this sounds like stable angina. What is angina and why is it stable in this case? Angina is chest pain specifically from coronary ischemia, and stable angina is when that chest pain only occurs with exertion. It's also often associated with shortness of breath. Right. Is angina always from atherosclerotic disease? No. So even though angina is most commonly from atherosclerotic plaque clogging up the coronary arteries, you can also get what's called demand ischemia when the heart isn't getting enough oxygen uh, from the blood, even though blood flow is actually normal. And the most common cause there would be anemia. Is there any other cause of angina that test writers like to get at? Yeah, so there's Prince metal or vasospastic angina, which occurs intermittently and generally in younger people. Counter cue, though, uh, the high yield treatment of choice for Prince metal angina. What's that, Ben? That would be a calcium channel blocker. And thank you, Yako, for that great counter cue. But I'm taking it back now. (laughs) When angina is from atherosclerotic disease, what's the specific pathophysiology behind it? With stable angina, we think about a chronic stable plaque, usually greater than 70% stenosis. Perfect. So getting back to our patient, what puts him at risk for angina? The strongest risk factors are his history of smoking and untreated hyperlipidemia. Other risk factors to consider would be type 2 diabetes and, to a lesser extent, family history. These risk factors are the same across the whole spectrum of coronary artery diseases. And what's the next best test to confirm a diagnosis of angina? We would want to get an EKG to look for any evidence of ischemia. Let's say that we do that and his EKG is normal. Is that surprising? That's actually not surprising at all. So with stable angina, you'll actually only see EKG changes with exertion. So since this patient has stable angina and they're not exerting themselves, an EKG at rest would be expected to be normal. So then what will we do next for diagnosis? In that case, since we still have a high suspicion for stable angina, we would order an exercise stress test, which consists of running or cycling while connected to EKG leads. Technically, you can also order an echo and that would be a correct answer as well. What if the patient can't tolerate exercise? In that case, we would turn to a different type of stress test called a pharmacologic stress test, and that uses either dobutamine or adenosine. First, how does an adenosine stress test work? So this is a tricky but important one to explain. So when a coronary artery has a bunch of plaque in it, it vasodilates all the way so as much blood as possible can get through it. Adenosine is a vasodilator. But since the blocked artery is already maximally dilated, giving the adenosine only increases the dilation and thus the flow to the healthy arteries. This then worsens the ischemia to the already poorly perfused heart areas, much like increasing O2 demand would during exercise. Wow. Beautiful explanation, Yaakov. I didn't understand it before right then, and now I do. Beautiful. How does dobutamine work as a stress test? Dobutamine mostly works as a beta-1 agonist, so it increases both inotropy, meaning the heart's contractility, as well as chronotropy, meaning the heart rate. This also increases O2 demand and thus worsens ischemia. What are situations, other than exercise intolerance, when you'd want to go right to your pharmacologic options? That would be if the patient has a left bundle branch block or a pacemaker. Let's wrap up our first patient. Exercise stress test shows ST depressions in V1 through V4 on exercise EKG. What's the diagnosis? So this confirms our suspicion of stable angina because signs of ischemia, especially ST changes or T-wave abnormalities, are diagnostic for coronary artery disease, regardless of which leads are involved. And trust me, we'll delve deep into specific leads in the next episode. 
which agents should he be sent home with? Any patient with coronary artery disease is sent home on aspirin and a statin, which have been shown to improve mortality, as well as a beta blocker, unless they have contraindications like bradycardia or hypotension. You'd also give nitroglycerin as needed for symptom relief. What's the pharma fizz behind giving nitrates and beta blockers to a patient with stable angina? So nitrates are venodilators, meaning they primarily dilate veins. And by dilating veins, you decrease preload. And oftentimes test writers, instead of saying the word preload, will call it left ventricular end diastolic pressure or LVEDP. And that decreased preload means less work for the heart muscle and therefore less pain, less angina. And then when it comes to beta blockers, those work by decreasing myocardial demand, specifically by decreasing inotropy and chronotropy. Thanks for that great explanation. Let's move on to our next case. All right. So let's say we have a 52-year-old male with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, and a 15-pack year smoking history. And he's coming in after an episode of mid-sternal chest pain while he was sitting on his couch. Prior to this, he had chest pain only after walking or eating a heavy meal. Vitals and exam are normal. EKG shows T-wave inversions. So Ben, what do you think is going on here? This sounds like unstable angina to me. Nice. So what gives you the idea that this is unstable angina? So unstable angina is defined as chest pain due to coronary ischemia at rest or severely increased chest pain from normal. Since he had the episode of pain on the couch, this couldn't be stable angina and must be unstable since he was at rest. Great. What's the specific pathophysiology behind unstable angina? That would be thrombus formation on top of a plaque, but less than 100% stenosis of the affected artery. And how do we differentiate this presentation from something like GERD? Great question, since test writers love to take advantage of the similarities in presentation, And this case mentioned he has the pain after heavy meals. So the main difference is that GERD pain exclusively occurs after meals and will cause symptoms such as nocturnal cough or an acidic slash metallic taste at the back of the throat, but not dyspnea. Risk factors like hyperlipidemia and smoking history also point towards atherosclerotic coronary artery disease as the cause of the chest pain. And with that, we wrap up this episode and continue next time with the myocardial infarctions. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. 